Indeed, um, inadequate reimbursement can be an issue, but this strongly depends on the individual healthcare system, of course. However, a worldwide unity is probably that payers will always try to reduce reimbursement and to cut budget. And they preferably do this in medical services and in specialties that provide no or little resistance to them. Thus, um, if you do not provide resistance and fight for your specialty, you make it easy for your payers to cut down the, the budget. And once this has happened, it is very difficult to get it back. However, the conclusion that payers only reimburse essential medical services and do not reimburse non-essential ones cannot be more false. Because the reimbursement plans of payers in many countries are not at all related to the latest evidence or guidelines. Despite being relevant, this is really a medical political issue that needs to be distinguished from what is medically required and necessary for the individual patient sitting in your office and expecting from you the best medical care and not politics. The problem, however, is really if doctors start to only perform diagnostics or treatments that are reimbursed by the payers, because then you make yourself a slave of the system. If we are the healthcare professionals, we should be involved in the decision-making process and we should um, bring in ourselves. Well, of course, a, a clinician's definition of essential diagnostics and those of insurance companies may be vastly different. And the entire landscape of reimbursement has really dramatically shifted in the past several years. And I think there's no practice that's been immune to these changes. However, for your dynamics specifically, we have actually not seen barriers to care for patients. As the documentation of our assessment really reveals the indications for the procedure, and we put this forth in very straightforward terms. So we'll discuss neurogenic etiology for their lower urinary tract symptoms, the complexity of their mixed incontinence picture, their prior surgical interventions, or concerns for storage symptoms in the male with possible bladder outlet obstruction, all are very robust indications for proceeding with urodynamics and help facilitate reimbursement. One easy answer to your question might be that we have to generate data to convince the payers and also defend urodynamic studies with true science. And national and international continents or urodynamic societies should be the pioneers in this manner. But on the other hand, the urodynamic study to me is like my reflex hammer. And these studies are essential in understanding the pathophysiology of lower urinary tract dysfunction of various pathologies in deciding on proper treatment. This is a well-established tool for objective diagnosis. And why do we need to convince the payers for that? Did we do the same effort with urine analysis or ultrasound? I don't know. <laughs>